And this is Kenya's biggest conversation, the Situation Room, broadcasting on Spice FM on KTN Home for two hours and online, Spice FM, KE, YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. So we've had a conversation about Kenya Mimi that is trying to, you know, encourage the youth, uh, boosting their um, feelings of patriotism and participation in government and gov governance and what they can also do to contribute to their own lives and also to contribute to the well-being of the country. Let's continue having a youthful conversation, but now shift it a little bit. Remember, we are in the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a conversation to start off the, the 16 days, and the 16 days are still not over. So let's now shift another conversation to a bit of the, uh, the younger, not the younger, a bit older or middle-aged adults, <laughs> youth. Mm. And these are the youth in colleges, okay? This has been said many, very, many, many times. In fact, there was even a BBC expose on um, this kind of story. What happens with the, the relationship between learners and students, especially in colleges and universities. And this is where there's a lot of sexual harassment. You want to sh change course from this one to the next. You go and find a certain uh, lecturer or administrative official and they tell you, okay, you know what you need to do. Mm. Or you want uh, to get gr better grades or not just better grades. You just basically want to get the, the grades that you deserve. And in some cases, a lecturer just tells you, <laughs> you know what, huh? play ball or I'm going to flank you. Mm. And this has happened very many times. We've seen this kind of complaints, not just in Kenya, but across the world. That BBC expose uh, was actually focusing on uh, Ghana, mm. and University Ghana, Nigeria, Ghana and yeah. Nigeria, and what was happening then. This is not a small matter. Isn't it? it isn't a small matter. Neither is it, uh, like you said, a foreign matter to many, mm. many countries. I mean, we're looking at things that happen whereby you may even want to change your course. You might uh, um, go and say you, you, there are certain things that you might want to do. Then the prerequisite to that is not a previous course, but your prerequisite then is what you're able to or not share with your lecturer. And you'll also find that you may have done stellar work throughout uh, the, the term of of your studies, but uh, because you refuse to look, either date your lecturer or sleep with them, then you were failed. Um, it's not, you'd be hard pressed to find many uh, young women who have gone through the system and have not experienced this, who've gone through a university and not experienced this at one point or another. Um, and these are some of the things that we're looking at in gender-based uh, gender violence when we're looking at the 16 days of activism and to say it's about time that we started to curb things like this. Um, but the, it's, it is rampant. It happens. It, uh, it's almost accepted in some cases whereby you even have some uh, young women who say, look, if we don't go that way, I'll either fail or I just, in some cases, you offer it up because you know that that is your way, your big ticket towards graduation with flying, with flying colors. Um, it's an unfortunate, it's an unfortunate situation in which it, it, it is currently. Unfortunately, you also have some institutions who don't take it very seriously. So now when we're talking, the question then becomes, how are we going to actually fight this? And so you can even start fighting at, at the institutional level whereby institutions take a hard stance about what can or cannot happen within um, there are boundaries like you know very well that these things are going on but oftentimes it has not been easy to pin it down on somebody because they are renowned uh, lecturer or professor or they've been with the institution for a very long period of time and you don't want that kind of shame of stain of shame on your institution the power play. exactly mm -hmm. but then the people who are stuck in the crosshairs are these young women who are trying to get an honest education you know i can't help but think about what you're saying and look at it in terms of really even as we try to tackle or to discuss ways in which we can tackle this problem, we are tackling the symptom, mm. not really the problem. Mm. Because you talk about the stain. You see, we see it as a stain. For something to be propagated and for it to be entrenched for as long as some of these activities have been, it means there are people who do not see it as a problem. Mm. The problem is it being exposed. But they accept it. And some even like it because... You're talking about something that isn't on the decrease, it's on the increase. Mm. So, how do you ensure that this activity is adequately stigmatized so that people understand that it is not what they would like it to be? How? I think it starts by talking about it. Absolutely. Openly, right? Remember the Me Too campaign that started in Hollywood? 
and caught fire around the globe. Mm. Me too, because um, you'd find these senior people in Hollywood, you want to have a, a part in a, in, in, in a movie, you want to have a part in a play, you just have to uh, make sure that you fall in the good books of the big producer. Good books. The executive producer, yes. And with all that, there was what then it meant. And when the women came out and exposed that and blew it out of the water and came up with the Me Too, we saw what has happened. People have actually gone to court. People have uh, been exposed. Very many cases have emerged. With people coming out to say, it happened to me too. Absolutely. It's a big way. You know, I mean, I, I just think about it. And I remember when I was in university and the same thing happened to me. Mm. The issue was, you know, don't, 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 don't talk about this thing too much. Just, mm. you know, leave it alone. Because, look, maybe if, if you let him know that you're actually going to report this to the authorities or whatever, he might just, you know give you the grade that you deserve and forget about this whole thing. But I realized that, you know what? It's not just me. If I don't speak about this, it's going to happen to somebody else mm -hmm. and somebody else and somebody else. And it, it was long-winded. I mean, I didn't have a grade. I was, I was failed in that particular course. And then a year later, after this then gentleman was fired from the institution and it became a big thing, then I got my grades reinstated. It was, a, it was terrible. I mean, you have to go through this whole thing, people looking at you and say, how could you go and report? Why would you do something like that? But guess what? Anybody else that it happens to then in the future, will then say, you know what, this is unacceptable because this is the stance that the institution has taken, number one, and they're not going to accept this. So I can actually speak up. And so that's what you're right. Stigmatize it. Let people say whatever it is that they want to say or stain, however, but you've brought it out into the open and that's how you get rid of the of the, of the cancer. So that the perpetrators will know that they will be exposed. That they will be yep. exposed, absolutely. So now let them think about the activities with that as a context. Mm. Yes. Knowing that, uh, and the kind of shame that it brings you, you mean you're a senior respected university professor and then someone comes out, not just one, but two, but three, but four students come out to say, you know, this is what he has tried to do or this is what he's forcing me to do. But that you know, has an impact on you as an individual. It does, but there's a flip side to this, mm. even as one listens to these uh, narratives and one listens to the outcomes, is that there are individuals within the institutions who are students, but who will not wait to be harassed. They themselves will make the offer mm. Mm -hmm. with the yes. understanding that this will produce the desired result. Absolutely. Yep. Yes. Absolutely. So essentially... We're talking about a situation that is abhorrent, but in many circles, it seems to have been normalized. So the participant is not, what should I say, uh, an overt victim. See, when a young person gets to think that the only way they can move ahead is not to study and to pass, but to offer their body so that they can actually get grades, something is really very really wrong here. Mm -hmm. Something has gone completely amiss. What is it though? I, I tend to think it's a socialization. It's you you have seen this is what happens. So you've sort of like at the back of your mind you see you think this is the normal thing to do. This is the normal thing that that's supposed to happen. I I I'm at pains to actually say that the student is the one who sits down and conceptualizes that this is the thing that I'm going to do so that I can get grades. There must be something. There must be something in the background of all this. Actually, it is part of a larger uh, narrative, if you ask me. Mm. When we talk about moral degradation and we talk about the corruption culture that we have in the country, the ease with which we bribe, you see, it doesn't end there. Mm. It ends with things that we do on a daily basis. And this is just an amplification of the compromises that we then introduce into our everyday life. This is what I'm trying to say. Mm. So that someone who ordinarily would have thought otherwise and realized that all I need to do is actually study and do what I'm supposed to mm -hmm. do. But they have been presented with this opportunity and they figure, wait, but why am I stressing myself with all these things and all I need to do is this? Now, when you arrive at that point and Eric, you are spot on, you realize you have a very serious problem. It's a big issue. You have a really serious problem on your hands. So anyway, the thing that you've said, in it, how can we how can we address this? How can we uh, start stopping this rampant and very widespread practice? There's a movement of students across the continent, and this one is called Campus Me Too, just borrowing from the same Me Too movement globally. Campus Me Too, which is students who are bringing up this issue, who are discussing the issue, who are campaigning across the continent so that people can get to know that this is wrong and we can fight this. And we're going to speak with uh, some of the leadership 
Uh, we are joined by Cesarine Mulobi. She is a spokesperson of the Campus Me Too movement. And also, we'll be joined by a university of, uh, a Kenyatta University student who's studying a BSc in Aerospace Engineering. This is Jael Diana. Good morning, ladies. Good morning. It's good, good morning. To, it's, it's good to have you both. Let's start with you, Cesarine Mulobi, because you're the spokesperson for the Campus Me Too. Just give us a background of Campus Me Too. What is it about? How do you uh, reach out to the people? And how do you help? Okay. Uh, so Campus Me Too is a student-led campaign that started sometime last year in the country uh, to just ensure that we uh, make sure that sexual harassment is not a thing anymore in our uh, institutions of higher learning and to ensure that our institutions of higher learning are safe spaces and conducive for our students to thrive in. So how we started, we, we started and realized this is one of the silent problems that people don't really talk about. And we did a survey just talking to about 1,015 students and where we got to realize that uh, a big number of students uh, is really sexually harassed. And you'd be surprised with the statistics that 49% of girls, uh, or rather ladies students, are actually sexually harassed, and 24% of men are sexually harassed as well. And then uh, the large number of the perpetrators uh, is in this particular case is in Highland Institutions, so we targeted every person in the Highland Institutions from the teaching staff to the non-teaching staff. 66% of these perpetrators were actually professors or lecturers. Okay. So now, with those numbers that we are looking at, so this is not something that it's, it's small and we're saying, okay, let's look at it uh, carefully. Now, uh, do institutions realize that this is a problem? Let's step away from the individuals. Are institutions understanding that this is a problem to the point whereby they need to do something about it? Is it like that to me? So are institutions, these, these are high numbers that you're talking about, Cesarine. Do institutions realize that there is a problem here beyond the conversation that's being had amongst uh, people who are the victims of this? Are institutions realizing that this is a problem so much so that they need to do something about it? Okay. Uh, so I think that this is an issue that has not been taken with the seriousness that it deserves from uh, institutions of higher learning in this particular country. However, we are having, with the, the movement uh, building up and students are speaking up, it is something that they are realizing that this is something that really needs to be addressed. Because we've had webinars with, uh, with lecturers and also just interacting with members of staff from universities, and they are actually acknowledging that this is something that has been going on for a very long time, but it has not been given the seriousness that it, it deserves. I'm loving that the fact that uh, these conversations are coming up and uh, through these conversations, we hope that they are going to take these matters with the seriousness that, uh, that it deserves. And that's why we also have the demands that we are having as a campaign. If you'd love, uh, and one of the demands is that we should at least have an Look at Having a problem with that line, uh, having a problem with that line of yours, Cesarine, let's actually bring in Jail as well. Jail Diana is a student at uh, Kenyatta University. Jail, you are part of this Campus Me Too uh, movement. Just tell us, why is it that you decided to join this uh, movement and what, what do you do personally in the movement? Um, thank you very much for this question. Um, am I audible enough? Yes, yes you are. Um, so my name is Jael Diana. I joined the campaign last year because um, as a student, I have experienced sexual harassment firsthand. But um, it took me two years to be able to find a space in which people who'd gone through the same thing had been through what, you know, were able to talk about the issues that they had been through. And at first, I was kind of, of, I mean, I was kind of scared. There's a lot of stigmatization and um, the victim blaming when it comes to issues of SGBV, especially around this nation of ours. And uh, but the moment I had other people's stories, it, it it was horrible. You know, like I would hear about people who were raped. I would hear about some people who were to drop out of school and 
these stories are even further than you know what what my story was and at that moment I knew I had to join this particular campaign if we have to do anything to get change then it will be us youth and students who are in institutions of higher learning mm. What is being demanded of students? I mean, and we're, and we're not looking at just girls. Previously, it was just young women who then were being approached by lecturers. Uh, um, but now we also have young men who are then being approached by lecturers, you know, uh, female lecturers. That, that's happening across the board. What are the demands that are being now made in today's, in today's uh, scenario? Um, as the Students who were in the movement, we sat down and uh, decided on five demands that we needed the Ministry of Education to implement. Um, the first demand was that every other student, every other student who joins the universities in their first years, need to get a learning material, a video, or a form of information talking about sexual harassment. What happens really is that uh, the first years freshers, in quotes, mostly fall prey. To, to, you know, predators um, of sexual and perpetrators of sexual harassment because they're new in the university, they, don't, they do not know who to talk to, they're kind of scared, they're naive. Um, so they, they're easy targets for uh, perpetrators of sexual harassment. Lecturers mm -hmm. and uh, the general staff of institutions be trained about sexual harassment and at the end of every year they sign a code of conduct and ethics that will bar them from um, promoting sexual harassment within our institution. Um, our third demand is that um, we get uh, an independent officer uh, who will look into the issues of sexual harassment, um, who is able to disseminate information and to the students and also in case the issues of if revealing cases of sexual harassment in institutions, then they can be able to do that. Um, the fourth demand is that we have in our universities and colleges that can look into these issues of sexual harassment. Um, so if some, a student has a missing mark, if a student is repeating a unit um, and the reason is related anything with sexual harassment then the universities need to give us a committee through which students can address their issues can talk about their issues and they be addressed properly and the fifth demand is that all the four things that i've mentioned today um, should be implemented in each and every institution of our learning that's colleges and universities policies on sexual harassment yeah that sounds like you know a very uh, well laid out um, uh, plan and also very, very easy demands. I just want to focus on this one of the independent officer that um, should be appointed to look at the issues. How would you like this independent officer identified and even appointed? Is it to be appointed by the institution without the participation of students or do you want the students to be the ones who identify and appoint or give some concurrence on the person who then becomes the holder of this office? Um, okay, uh, an independent gender officer. Uh, the reason why we need this this particular person to be independent from the institution, mostly the thing which happens is um, most of the institutions are trying to protect the image of the school. So is there sexual harassment? Do we want to take it to court? No. Do we want it to reach the media? No. They don't want to do that because the, the image of the school is important. Yeah. But then if we are able to get somebody, probably um, a government employee, mm -hmm. something like that, who is not affiliated in any way to the university, then we can be able to, um, students can be able to address this issue and, you know, be heard without any prejudice or bias. Okay, so the person is not in any way affiliated to the university or the student's body. So then where does a person come from? Have you gone as far as thinking or even putting it together and saying, this is what we want. We want a person maybe from, um, I don't know, the judiciary, the Ministry of Youth or Ministry of, in charge of gender to be the one who is seconded into each of these institutions? Um, I'm not really specific. I have no specific details of that. I'll kindly pass this question to Tizarin. 
All right, so Cesar, we're having a, a bit of a technical issue with uh, having Cesar on the line, and so we'll we'll ask we'll pose the question to her as we continue uh -huh. the conversation. So we're basically we'll, what we're having a conversation about this time is uh, gender-based violence and especially sexual harassment in universities and institutions of higher learning, colleges to universities where students are sexually harassed by lecturers, by officers of these institutions you know in demand for in, in fact it's it's basically demand for sexual favors from the students mm -hmm. you know ex in exchange for grades in exchange for uh passing your exam in exchange for even getting uh, amenities or even being able to change your courses if you want to and this is something that's big the ladies that we're talking to this morning are Jal diana she is a student at kenyatta university and Cesarin, Cesarin Malobi is the spokesperson for this Pan-African organization, which is called the Campus Me Too movement. And the Campus Me Too movement basically across the continent is bringing in together all these uh, uh, youthful people to campaign for this. CG, when you hear this, do you feel that, you know, it's a good way, it's a good step to start? Have they started at the right uh, place with the right uh, agenda in mind? I think the agenda they have is spot on. Mm. They should rev it up a little more. Because the, unfortunately, when you read about these things, what you probably hear and what is in the public domain is the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. There's usually a lot more that hasn't been said because, unfortunately, when people get harassed sexually, they themselves get stigmatized. And because of that, they are completely unwilling to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Because there's a feeling of how it will impact on them and how, how it will reflect on them. And yet... There is no other way, as you correctly put it, unless you shed a very bright light on this issue so that it is seen for what it is. Uh, you will not begin uh, that journey to ensuring that you put an end to it. And you know, the thing about not putting an end to it at the, sp at the spot where you are is that the net carries on beyond uh, um, a campus, beyond educational institution. It then goes further to where you work in the future, to whether you want to get into government. It car it has a carry-on effect. Exactly to who you are. Really. Exactly. Mm. It ca yes. has, has carry-on effect. Whether you are the harasser or you're the harassee, it carries on no matter where you go to. And if you want to look at Namibia as an example, what have they been in the streets fighting about for the, uh, protesting about for the last few months? This very same thing, mm. that, that sexual harassment became institutionalized from education until the working class, even into government. And we're saying, you know what? Yes, we've been harassed. Yes, there are young women and men who've been harassed sexually or demanded of in order to get certain things done carries on into the very fabric of society and government and you're saying okay yes we've been harassed but if we don't shine a light on it we're never going to be able to get rid of this thing having a conversation with Cesarine Molobi who is a spokesperson for the campus me too movement and Jal Diana who's a student at KU and we are talking about students being harassed by their lecturers and by uh, yeah. university administrations or college administrations. So as we were having a conversation, Jail told us about what the Campus Me Too movement is doing and the kind of the five demands, the six demands that they have, which is goes up all the way to uh, asking that all lecturers and all sign a code of conduct, having an independent gender officer appointed into each of these institutions, having a review committee that if students feel that maybe I've been flanked and it was unfair, then there's a review committee that can review all these grievances and see if indeed there are grounds, then that can also be reviewed. And having this, all these uh, taken to all uni institutions of higher learning, colleges and universities, good way to start. Cesarine Muloba is uh, back with us on the line. And uh, this is a question that we had asked uh, Diana before and we're asking, so what are you talking about having all these uh, uh, demands that have been put very well by by Gile and what you have presented how far are you in having conversations with either the institutions of higher learning or the, even the ministry of education or at government level to have this properly documented and institutionalized okay so last year we handed over the petition to the ministry of education in the presence of the principal secretary then Honorable Safina Kwekwe of the State Department of Gender. And uh, so we've been following up on the petition uh, which lies at the Ministry of Education. It's been one year later. Nothing has been done about it. So we wrote a memorandum to the Ministry inquiring on the uh, status of the petition. And right now we are just uh, waiting for communication from the Ministry and what we are kindly asking is that they need to act on this because this really is not a lesser issue. It's, it should be prioritized 
because we are talking about uh, uh, in as much as we are having online learning we are not we are still talking about cases of sexual harassment we still have sexual harassment happening even through online platforms and and when we when students get back to school uh, in, in in january probably next year uh, or sometime later next year we are still going to be experiencing these cases this, so this is something that really needs to be prioritized by the ministry and we hope that the ministry of education really gives a directive uh, to all uh, universities so that this demand really can be uh, implemented in all these universities the question that keeps um, running through my mind is um, what do you do in cases where the purported perpetrator actually ends up wanting to marry their victim Oh, that's a big one. Cesarine, so, take a break. Breathe on that. Reflect on how you want to respond to this. And also as well to Jarl, because this question will come to both of you. Coming to the top of the hour, this is Kenya's biggest conversation, the Situation Room. We are talking about the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence and now focusing on gender-based violence in institutions of higher learning. Students have been complaining and we know that this is uh, something that's so rampant. You don't even need to ask yourself, oh, have I ever heard about this? You must have heard about this, where students are harassed by their lecturers, especially female students. And we are being told it's not just female students. Actually, the complaints are, or what has been recorded is 49% female students and 24% male students. So it's on both genders, the male and female students who are facing this kind of harassment. Continuing the conversation with the two ladies, Cesarine Malobi, uh, who is Malobi, who is a spokesperson for the Campus Me Too movement, and Jal Diana, who is a student at Kenyatta University. Repeat your question, CT. My question is, this situation, it's a scenario that I'm painting where you have a perpetrator mm -hmm. in the form of a lecturer, a teacher, and then you have a victim in the form of a student, and there is a little matter of the perpetrator wanting to marry the victim. And usually to the consent of the victim. What do you do? So they actually do develop a proper relationship. So we're told. But you see, it's an imbalanced uh. one. Because to begin with, if you are in the position of the teacher, you already are... Power. Yes. Mm. The, the power dynamics are already in your favor. So. All right, Cesarine, take that. Okay. I like that he's already mentioned the question of power dynamics because uh, now this is not coming it doesn't matter what ends up coming out of that the the starting ground is not right it is sexual harassment and how a perpetrator can change the uh, intentions and now all of a sudden they have decided now to become a good person that's a little bit uh, uh contradicting uh, it, it contradicts uh the the moral uh obligation of the lecturer I mean, they should not be able to do that. And we, we're not going to excuse uh, their intentions now of wanting to uh, take this relationship to a serious level. The thing is that it started on wrong ground and it is not right. And it should not happen in the first place. And even so, just to continue that this is abuse of office. Uh, you cannot use your position of authority to do whatever you please. And then you get away with it simply because now you change your intentions. I don't think it is right. It should not happen. Okay. But does it happen? That really is what I want to ask. Does it happen? Yes. I have not come across any such uh, scenario. Mm. Most of the time, it ends, uh, it ends in tears, really. Mm. Thank you. There's also the other question can that you I, asked. Can, can, I, yes, uh, can I give my opinion on this? Yes. Um, first of all, I'd like to focus our attention on the fact that our campaign is focusing on lecturers of members of staff of institutions um, abusing students. Um, we are really we are looking at the power dynamics and who is in authority here. And to be honest with you, people, look, the students and lecturers who are in a consensual relationship is the minority. Our campaign is focused on addressing issues and speaking out for the silent majority in this particular environment and in this particular setting. Um, on the issue of relationships developing into to marriage between students and lecturers, there are two things here that are really important, professionalism and manipulation. A lecturer, a student is under lecturer. In the learning environment, they're supposed to be like parents to us. They're supposed to be a you know, source of guidance and instructions and moral, you know, just moral guidance in general. 
So if such a relationship comes up, then we then we should be asking about professionalism. Is this person professional enough to be handling or to be in charge of students in an environment? The other thing about manipulation is for um, for a junior to be to agree to to be in a consensual relationship with somebody who is in authority with them. I am hundred percent sure that. There's a lot of manipulation that has taken place. There's a lot of promising. There's a lot of trading of favor, uh, both ways, academically and uh, in terms of, I mean, in return, getting sexual favors that is involved in such kind of setup. Yeah. When you said that you had taken your petition to the ministry and the government, have you also taken the same petition to members of parliament, maybe in the National Assembly or the Senate, Cesarin? No, that has not been done. Uh, we have not taken the petition to the uh, parliament mm. because uh, we, we hope that the ministry will be able to act on this. If not, we intend to take uh, the ombudsman way to force them to issue a directive. Okay, I've got, I've got some news for you. Um, one of our listeners is Senator Sylvia Kasanga, and she's just uh, sent, sent in a message. And she encourages you to send your petition to the Senate, and she says she'd like to help you out. I'll share your number with her, and uh, so that she, then you you can contact each other, and maybe take this petition as well to the houses of uh, legislature, both the National Assembly and the Senate, so that there is all round pressure for this to happen. I'd Thank like you. to uh, okay. So, Gile, you 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 mentioned the silent majority for whom nobody is able to hear. I'd like to ask at this point, and it sounds like an almost obvious answer, but why is the majority silent about this abuse that's taking place? That's one part of the question. The second part is, is not their merit about being very loud about what is happening? All right. Um, that's it? Okay. Uh, one year plus that I've worked on this campaign, four things I've stood out, you know, I've stood out, I've taken president as to why students do not speak up when they're sexually harassed. First, first time is addressed by the demand of our campaign. Most students say, I did not know where to go to. I didn't know who to talk to. Like, um, I was very surprised if the girl was talking to a fifth-year student in my school, and uh, we were having this conversation. She didn't even know that Kenyatta University has a gender office, that such kind of issues can be addressed through. The other thing is uh, most people fear social consequences of talking about their experiences. Um, like I said before, there's a lot of stigmatization and uh, victim blaming uh, when it comes to such uh, such issues of SGBV. The other reason as to why students do not speak, speak up is they think it wasn't serious enough to report. As I've been going around universities um, spreading awareness on the issue of sexual harassment in our institutions, I've met students who didn't even know they were harassed. But then at some point when I have a conversation with them, they were like, ah, that lecturer asked me what my body count in class. I was so embarrassed. Later on, after we have this conversation, is when she realizes, wow, well, okay, this is this I was actually harassed. They don't know. And then the other issue is students fear that uh, their cases will not be dealt with in confidentiality. Some people want um, to go to a lecture of somebody senior and report, and they want their issues to be dealt with in, you know, like in a particular office, and they get particular results. But such kind of cases of sexual harassment get messy. Um, Majorly, it's because these things require evidence. And we are students. We do not walk around with cameras, like the BBC documentary that you mentioned at the beginning. We don't have such kind of equipment. And we do not know when, at what time are you going to be harassed? At what time is a lecturer or some a staff going to ask to tell you that you're looking sexy in that particular attire and make... Um, and want unnecessary jokes mm -hmm. about your sexual nature. We are not prepared to face this kind of thing. So we don't have, we don't have evidence. You're not recording. You're not always walking around with your video on. Um, to kindly repeat your second question. I, I seem to have forgotten. 
So there's some merit in speaking out, you know, and for those who have been through harassment and have actually spoken out about it, have seen the benefit of speaking out. And the benefit in a, for a lot of people far outweighs the shame that you would feel in the interim. Isn't it something that we should be talking about? Because now you want to say, speak out about it. Um, talk about it as much as you can. Bring it out from these shadows that were lurking in there. We don't really want to speak about it. Because if you do, what you do is you shine the light on the perpetrators. You shine the light on them. And then they probably would be deterred from um, um, doing this or repeating this to somebody else. So is there merit in talking about it despite the fear and the shame uh, that, uh, that the victims would feel? Um, I'd go quite personal on this question. As an activist on this particular campaign and the face of the Campus Me Too campaign, really the merit that I see is the positivity and us getting changed. That is the most important thing to me as an activist. The moment at, in which um, I get to the point that lecturers or people working in the universities don't see our campaign as us against them, but then they join us together as we try to create safe spaces and safe learning environments for students, then that is my joy, that we achieve something positive and that this movement will address this issue and put it to rest. What I wonder, even as I listen to all this, huh, um, is this a campaign that even young men are involved in in the university or is it just purely young women? And Yes, there are percentages of young men will to face the harassment, but the question I want to ask is, are there sufficient uh, cases of your fellow students also joining these perpetrators in harassing women? Or do we have cases of female students harassing male students? Mm. Maybe Cesarin, you can take this. Okay. Um, just first to mention that uh, it is true that we have ambassadors who are men, who are part of our campaign because we have a l large pool of ambassadors who are just spreading the message about the campaign. Number two, the question on uh, harassment between students and students, of course that happens. Uh, it is something that happens in, in schools, uh, but the thing is with the campaign now, we are just focusing on, on, on the harassment from the, uh, from the people in authority towards uh, students. Uh, when it comes to harassment between students be uh, and students, among students themselves, uh, something that happens is even had cases of rape uh, between students. Uh, I think this is also something that has been provided for in our laws and, and there are uh, measures that someone can take to be able to report such, uh, such cases and they'll be able to get help. However, for the purposes of this, we focus on the harassment from professors and, and lecturers towards the students. You know, the why you hear that pause is I am simply thinking of the victims and <clears throat> the lifelong effects that some of these things have uh, on their lives after. Do you, is there a plan? Is there thinking? Is there uh, a forward looking agenda for? what in terms of counseling in terms of ensuring that uh whatever wrong has been committed that this these individuals who are involved and who have been violated have an opportunity to set this wrong right in their personal lives uh psychosocial support is yes. one thing that is coming out very strongly while we are doing this campaign and the question that we are asking is that uh, even the higher learning institutions that we are talking about do they have the capacity to ensure that there is counseling towards students and even if it's there uh, are the students seeking this help are they assured of confidentiality that's a question that we really need to be thinking about and also the question of just pro bono legal services towards uh, for, for the students who when they experience these cases and, and they need uh, someone to take up their cases so that uh, they're able to get justice that's also another thing that we we, we we need to be thinking about as we continue with the campaign currently what do we have okay we have a, 
a dean of students okay we have deans of students what do we have in the university currently that can cater for such needs currently what do we have uh, it, it differs from one university to the other, but yes. most universities ideally have a, a counseling a department that deals with such cases. Uh, and, uh, and the reporting mechanisms uh, for different universities also, they are different. Yes, and you'd find that, uh, as, as, as Zell, I think, mentioned earlier, we don't have, uh, not all universities have a sexual harassment policy. So that also is one of the gaps that we are seeing when it comes to addressing this. However, ideally, we should have counseling centers in all universities to ensure that psychosocial support is offered to students in terms of uh, such matters and uh, also reporting mechanisms. However, they're not clearly defined. Uh -huh. So essentially what you're saying is there exists a gap. Yes. Now, have you considered partnering because there are bodies like this morning we're talking to UN, UNFP. Uh, did I? Uh, UNFP. UNFPA. A. There's an A at the end of the P. Yes. Okay, there's UNFPA. Uh, now, they, they, they actually work with empowerment. And uh, there is UN Women's. I mean, there are, there are organizations that have a mechanism and a structure to support activities such as the ones that uh, you have set in motion. Have you approached such organization to see how best you can work with them? Okay. Uh, so, yes, we are open and we welcome partnerships. And currently, as you just mentioned, UN Women Kenya is one of the uh, major partners in this particular campaign and also ActionAid, uh, which uh, is really supporting the students' movement. However, we are really open to uh, other partnerships. And as you're mentioning, we look forward to uh, partnering with other organizations and like-minded individuals to ensure that we achieve our goal and objective. May I suggest that you have a strategy for seeking them out so that you cast that particular net really wide? Um, uh, it is important to be ready to participate with them, but it's also important to seek them out. Yeah. Indeed it is. I want to talk about, so Campus Me Too is an Africa-wide movement. So in each other uh, African countries, are you active and how, uh, how are you all linked together? Uh, I guess I'll answer that. Yes. Uh, we are currently just in Kenya because even our survey really was just focused in, in we, we focused on Nairobi and its environs. However, also, I think that's another conversation that we really need to have. Uh, partnering, we have seen, we have other similar movements in Uganda. There was a time we had a similar movement in Uganda. It should be going on. We also uh, had the, the, the famous uh, movement in Nigeria about the sex for grave, and it's still going on, and we're seeing a lot of ha uh, happening, even in, the, like, in terms of legislation. So uh, we hope that we will uh, be able to even partner with these other uh, movements that are existing in other parts of Africa, and that we will cast our nets wider and, and deeper, even in the continent, mm. to ensure that we cap this menace. In as, in as much as um, we're looking at government and looking at, you know, hoping that there will be, you know, on various points, uh, legislation passed, at least a keen interest being applied where all the, of this is concerned. I'm still going to go back to the institutions that are concerned because that is where um, a lot of these cases are taking place. Institutional leadership, are they vested in shining the light on what is going on because students can be complaining within these institutions take it to their relative governments but the actors in my opinion one of the vital actors is institutional leadership are they vested are they interested in what we're talking about here to say that we also have to take a pivotal role in making sure that we are doing all that we can to remove this we are still holding conversations with different institutions however i'd say we have received great support from some of the vice chancellors and just to mention uh, the current vice chancellor for the technical university of kenya uh he was very positive to this uh because he's the only one uh, who probably attended uh, our launch of the campaign and he was very positive and he said this is something that really we must work on so I think any sober leader who has the best interests of the students at heart should be able to embrace this and ensure that really students are thriving in higher learning institutions and, and to deal with anything 
uh, including sexual harassment that makes their stay in school uh, miserable or uh, tormenting. I want to thank you very much, ladies, for joining us this morning. Cesarin Mulobi is a spokesperson of the Campus Me Too movement. As we mark the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence this year, we have decided also to give focus and attention to this particular issue, and this is sexual harassment in institutions of higher learning, between um, where students are actually harassed by those uh, in authority over them, and this is, is lecturers and also members of staff of these institutions. So the Campus Me Too movement is out to highlight these issues we've given you a platform and to talk about this thank you very much cesarine malobi and also jail diana who is in kenyatta university have a lovely day ladies you too thank, thank you. you thank you this is the situation room the only way to start your day